good afternoon. This is uh, Professor Raghev. Uh, we are meeting for the uh, nuclear. This is Professor Raghib. We are meeting for the NPRE 457 uh, class. Uh, this is our first lecture. Uh, the earlier attempt were failed, uh, but uh, so it is being re recorded back uh, again. And uh, I will not uh, waste time. I'll go and share uh, the screen. Uh, I suggest that you connect to our website by remembering the link here, https colon slash slash mraghep.com. And uh, <clears throat> uh, having connected to that link, you get to that page right here. Uh, you can connect to our course material on that link, the safety analysis of nuclear reactor systems. Uh, I'll come back to this uh, link later on uh, by going to the original uh, portal. On that portal, you'll find the uh, links to other courses that I'm teaching, uh, the nuclear power engineering course. Uh, I also teach a course on wind power systems the next semester, uh, uh, a course on energy storage, and uh, uh, as well as courses on Monte Carlo simulation and uh, engineering. You can find the material on the uh, World Wide Web. There is also a blog that you could see uh, here. Uh, an interesting link is uh, for those of you looking for jobs in the nuclear industry, that's a link that can direct you to, for interviews if you have interviews uh, uh, to make. Uh, other links uh, are simply uh, fun to connect to. Uh, I have uh, a list of book chapters that you can uh, read. Uh, uh, book editors <clears throat> find interesting chapters in the lecture notes, so they ask to turn them into chapters in their books. Several journal papers shown here, uh, articles, lots of videos, including videos uh, of connections to the latest classes that have been uh, taught. Uh, then you find the conference papers from many students, uh, especially those uh, graduates who turn in term papers. Uh, you'll find uh, some book reviews, uh, technical uh, reports, quite a bit of them. So just uh, go and explore it. Uh, uh, that uh, portal gives you an idea about the interest of the teacher. Uh, in that case, <clears throat> energy in general uh, is my area of interest. And uh, I share the vision uh, with many uh, scientists and engineers that uh, our future is going to be a future where uh, nuclear energy is connected to the renewables, hence, of course, on wind power system. The dependence on fossil fuel is weaning. Uh, we have to admit that this is a dependence that have been created over 200 years of using fossil fuels, coal, petroleum, and natural gas. And uh, the depletion of these resources is in fact occurring. So that should be a concern in addition to the concerns about uh, climatic change. Uh, not wasting uh, time, we go to our link here, the course link, Safety Analysis of Nuclear Reactor Systems for the fall of 2022. That's why we are joined together. Uh, I uh, provide you with a complete set of notes that were developed for that class. So you notice here that all those links uh, are chapters in the topic that we are going to cover this semester. Whenever you find the new sign, that means that this is uh, a topic that I have covered in the lecture notes. In that case, you are responsible for reading the content as well as taking 
tests after working on some assignments on those uh, topics in general. Today we are going to cover uh, the preface and maybe also have time to uh, cover the chapter on the uh, overview. Uh, we have a calendar for the, this fall, uh, the different uh, 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 instructional material that the campus wants us to follow, but uh, in our class, we'll have three uh, exams, uh, one missed term already set for September 30th, a second midterm set for October 31st, and the final, the campus tell us it's on December 12th at 7 to 10 p.m. You have to take the final exam, otherwise the campus rules tell me that you get a final score of F. We don't want anybody to get that score, obviously, here. Uh, the undergraduate students uh, receive three hours of credit for taking the course. The graduates will take uh, four hours, provided they present a term paper or an advanced uh, project uh, uh, as an extra effort uh, for the four hours rather than three hours again. Uh, we have uh, the help of some teaching assistants. If you click the link for those assistants, it's shown here. They'll help uh, uh, post some hours where you can connect them on the phone or on the internet. Please be kind enough not to wake them at midnight. Uh, these are their emails where you can also connect to them. Uh, after each lecture, there will be an assignment assigned to the lecture. It is shown here in that link in the PDF format as well as the Word format. So if you go to the uh, PDF format, you can see it's already shown right here. Uh, this is the assignment for the first lecture that we have had. And uh, in that case, you have a reading assignment to read the preface as well as the overview, and then apply the material in uh, the chapter in the lecture with two simple problems uh, with, uh, that uh, depend on whatever we have covered in those uh, two lectures. Uh, we need, uh, uh, you need to turn in the lecture one week from the date it was assigned. So that was our first lecture on the 22nd. Uh, the assignment is due on the 29th. Where do you submit the assignment? You submit the assignments to the canvas uh, uh, of illinois.edu. Uh, the te teaching assistants will uh, receive the, uh, the, <clears throat> the assignment from you. They'll grade them and you'll see your grades on the canvas uh, platform. Uh, we can try to connect to it here without losing our connection. <coughs> uh, it is uh, making it difficult, so I'll just avoid it here. Uh, in case of the resurgence of the COVID-19, I give you here the detail on how to proceed. So we are ready for a resurgence of any uh, <clears throat> variants or any mutations of the, the virus. Uh, you'll find uh, then that uh, uh, we have a complete set of lecture notes here. These are not, this is not just uh, PowerPoint presentations. This is a complete set uh, of notes. Uh, notes. Uh, this exceeds the, what uh, uh, the public service that uh, universities provide uh, in general. And uh, here uh, uh, we provide co a complete set of lectures rather than just depending on, uh, 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 <clears throat> on PowerPoint presentations. So let us start here immediately since we have lots of energy. Uh, the topic that uh, we are covering is the probabilistic, possibilistic, and deterministic safety analysis. Uh, probabilistic safety analysis depend on the use of probability theory to determine the risk and uh, implement it in the design of all engineering systems. It is most important, obviously, in the nuclear <clears throat> industry because the consequences of accidents can be quite large. But uh, the approach has been uh, immediately adopted by uh, the civil engineering uh, field, building bridges and skyscrapers and roads, and uh, also by the aerospace industry. So the knowledge that we are going to share here goes across all the uh, engineering disciplines in general. However, there is another field of knowledge that is emerging, uh, which is uh, uh, designated as possibilistic uh, 
uh, safety analysis. Uh, and that one depends on possibility theory rather than probability theory. As we learn later, uh, probability theory depends on the algebra of logic using as a basic construct the, of the Boolean algebra, whereas possibility theory also is based on the algebra of knowledge uh, of uh, 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 the <clears throat> of logic, uh, but uh, it is based on what we are going to call a De Morgan algebra, and uh, uh, an aspect of it is what we call fuzzy logic. You'll see that it offers possibilities for the safety analysis and the monitoring and the control of engineering system far exceeding what probability theory uh, uh, provides us with. Probability theory deals only with random variables. Possibility uh, theory uh, deals with information, which is a measurement or a random variable that is giving a meaning through fuzzy logic. So probability theory de deals with data, like temperature, flow rate, uh, height. Uh, possibility theory deals with information. When you start saying temperature is cold, temperature is high, uh, road is icy. There is a qualification to the random variable or the measurement that we have. So that is a part maybe of uh, sixth generation uh, computing. Uh, probabilistic uh, uh, safety assessment and possibilistic safety assessment uh, are based on the algebra of logic. Same as uh, uh, in the case of electrical engineering circuit analysis. Uh, but uh, there is another uh, uh, aspect of safety analysis that we call mechanistic safety analysis or uh, deterministic safety analysis. In that case, we depend on uh, the uh, uh, conventional uh, theory of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, 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 the differential and integral equations or so differential and integral calculus. In that case, we are going to try to deal with as many of the accidents that have happened uh, as a way of providing experience. For instance, uh, we deal with the safety of different reactor systems, but you could see here, we cover most of the accidents, three mile accident, Chernobyl, the uh, wind scale accident, all the accidents that uh, we know of in the nuclear uh, industry in that case. All right, so here uh, we, uh, get started on our first uh, chapter. And uh, <clears throat> we try to justify why is it that uh, we need to deal with the safety of nuclear systems. As I suggested, the uh, nuclear energy is going to be part of our uh, future <clears throat> uh, for a very simple reason. Uh, the, our star, the sun, has provided our planet, the Earth, with uh, nuclear energy in the form of solar radiation over 200 million years. And that energy has been stored in, as we know, uh, the fossil fuels uh, uh, in the oceans, petroleum, uh, are remains uh, of fish and plankton in sedimentary rock. Uh, we have uh, coal from the remains of uh, wood uh, in forests, as well as uh, natural uh, gas. <clears throat> so these fossil fuels have been stored. It's stored energy from our star, the sun, uh, stored over 200 million years. But in fact, we are using it within only a span of 200 years. So we have to worry more about the depletion of these resources uh, compared with uh, more than, in fact, we should uh, worry about their modifying and changing our climate, which is uh, also a hurdle for the continuation of our uh, civilization. Uh, this is uh, a graph that describes to us uh, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> what is happening to what we call conventional uh, petroleum. <clears throat> conventional is petroleum that you drill out of uh, wells by drilling a well, uh, in contrast to what is named as hydraulic fracturing, which is uh, extracting hydrocarbons from tight formations. Uh, fracking or uh, hydraulic fracturing is another new technology, but it is also limited in its scope. The discoveries of oil wells and the, what they call elephant uh, fields, a uh, very large field like the Hawar field in Saudi Arabia, have peaked around 1960. 
Uh, it peaked another time when uh, oil was discovered in uh, Alaska in the United States. And then uh, another peak is maybe occurring with the advent of uh, uh, horizontal well drilling and the process of hydraulic fracturing now in the petroleum industry. You'll find that uh, the discoveries uh, that are expected in our future is a curve that comes down, it's speculative. Uh, there are no large oil wells to be discovered uh, in the conventional area, at least for now. Uh, yet to see that the consumption has been going up. So we are consuming a resource that is not being renewed uh, for our uh, future energy needs. Hence, of course, the interest in nuclear energy in combination with the renewables as a vision for future uh, energy supplies. Uh, this is not pie in the sky. You could see that uh, in the UK, uh, they exploit exploited the natural gas and the oil supplies in the North Sea, and they had two peaks in the production, but now they are down. So they have, they have used their main resources. Uh, Norway, Denmark, and the Netherlands also have reached peak uh, oil production. This is it total, total oil production in million barrels per uh, day. Uh, so you'll find that they have an emphasis now, at least in the UK, on wind power generation in the North Sea, and uh, <clears throat> in addition uh, to nuclear energy. Norway, if you read about Norway, has in fact banned the use of ICEs on their roads by 2025, meaning that they cannot use internal combustion engines on cars that are switching completely to electrical vehicles. What is the uh, uh, direction in that case? The direction is to move from coal to nuclear energy. And uh, unknown to people, in fact, is that the risk from using coal is primarily from air pollution. You could see here that uh, per terawatt uh, hour, one watt, of course, is a unit of power, one joule per second. And when you say terawatt, that is one trillion uh, uh, watt hour. When you multiply the watts, uh, joule per second into hour, turn the hour into seconds, you get joules. So this is a death per unit of energy. You could see that is uh, uh, from air pollution. And the reason is that uh, the amounts of coal that we burn to produce a certain amount of energy is very low compared to what you get from nuclear energy. Hence, uh, you cannot contain the products of the combustion, uh, like in nuclear energy, the fission products from the nuclear reactions are contained uh, inside the reactor fuel uh, that is uranium, maybe mined from the ground and back again after we burn it, we return it back to the ground. But in the burning of coal, petroleum, uh, as well as natural gas, uh, we use open system. So the products of combustion are simply diluted in the environment. And hence, uh, we are modifying the climate of our earth. It's the same as uh, fish in a fish tank, polluting uh, the environment that they are living in. Uh, one advantage of the use of nuclear energy is the power flux. Uh, that graph shows us here uh, the power uh, the power flux, like in watts per meter squared, how much energy is generated per meter squared. Uh, if you use wind power, it is 2.5 watts per meter squared. Solar photovoltaics is five watts per meter squared. But compare this to nuclear energy. This is 1,000 watts per meter squared. So uh, nuclear energy is a very highly concentrated source of energy. It, uh, we say that it has a high power density, if it's per unit, per unit volume, we say it's uh, <clears throat> specific energy when it is per unit uh, mass. And uh, these are the needs, in fact, uh, by Mr. David McKay uh, of different uh, nations in the world. You could see here that the developing nations, uh, you take India, you take uh, the Sudan, uh, they have a very low consumption per person, per capita. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, yet their population density like India here and China are very high. The United States uh, and Canada even uh, more has low population densities, but they are very high uh, energy consumers. And it has to do with 
the land mass that the United States, Canada, and Australia are using. That table shows us the different uh, power fluxes in how much power is generated per <clears throat> meter squared of area of the energy producing device. You could see that nuclear electricity is 1,000 watts per meter squared. Uh, it is the highest that we know of in nature. If you use solar, solar, solar uh, photovoltaics, we are only in the range of 250 watts per meter squared. If you think about uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, wind power, it's only 2.5 watts per meter squared. So we can say that uh, even though renewables are going to be part of our vision of the future, wind, solar, uh, uh, hydroelectric, but uh, all nuclear is there to provide us with bids, load generation, and uh, very high capacity factors for uh, the power production process. Uh, the low uh, risks from nuclear energy come in uh, because of course uh, it's a closed system. So we do not disperse in the environment the products of the uh, fission process, but also a much smaller amount of materials in use to produce a unit of energy. So if you say, you take the mass of materials, in tons per terawatt hour. Terawatt means uh, 10 to the uh, 15th uh, watts, joule per second multiplied by hour. So that's uh, tons, the weight, uh, the ton, N-N-E-S is not, is a metric ton, which is 1,000 kilogram. This is uh, the ton in French. If you write only T-O-N, that's a British or the American ton, which is measured in 20, uh, 2,240 uh, pounds. Solar photovoltaics as, this, uh, as a renewable energy source uses a very large amount of materials. Hydroelectric power uses lots of materials too. You'll see primarily here that's uh, concrete. Same for nuclear energy with also steel a little bit for nuclear energy. But the amount of materials used are uh, much less and uh, because of the high concentration of uh, nuclear energy. A single fission event, as we all know, produces 200 million electron volt per fission, uh, whereas the, this, the uh, ionization of a hydrogen atom, typical of chemical reaction, is only reactions is only 13.6 electron volts. So this is a, a factor in the millions times per reaction for nuclear energy compared to the renewables. Yet our future is this: a combination of the nuclear as well as the renewables, solar photovoltaics, hydroelectric, wind, uh, geothermal, and even solar thermal, where you concentrate the solar energy and uh, use a steam cycle in that case. Notice that uh, uh, we worry, obviously, about carbon emissions, uh, even though nuclear is advocated as a, a non-carbon source, that is not 100% true because when you manufacture the steel and the aluminum or any uh, materials used in nuclear power operation, you are using electricity. And in the United States, 40% uh, of our electricity still is being produced by coal. Solar farms uh, would still release uh, 48 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour of energy produced. Geothermal as well as hydropower exceed nuclear energy, yet we still have to depend on those renewables uh, in combination of nuclear energy for the future uh, in that case. When we deal with nuclear energy, we deal with radiation, but the fraction that is attributed to nuclear energy is very low, as you could see here. Uh, the, we receive uh, most of our radiation, 84% of it from the natural uh, environment. Uh, as uh, you could see here, 9.5% from food, 12% from cosmic rays, 15% are beneficially used in medical application. And uh, uh, the buildings that we live in, if you, have, if you live in a wooden house, uh, the carbon-14 in the wood uh, is radioactive. It is formed by the interaction of cosmic rays with the nitrogen and, uh, in the, and oxygen in the atmospheres. So uh, nuclear uh, uh, <clears throat> contribution to the discharge of radioactivity is quite low, not to worry about. 
Uh, along this line, you'll find that uh, our future is going to be dependent on nuclear energy. And uh, uh, the hope is that uh, uh, this uh, modest effort will contribute to the scientific uh, literacy of the readers uh, in the safety areas of knowledge. As I suggested, when you learn, learn about nuclear safety, you learn uh, about uh, its application in most of the fields of science and engineering. Without wasting time, we turn into the overview so that you can solve the assignment. Uh, we would like here in the second chapter to consider the evolution uh, of nuclear energy in history. And uh, <clears throat> you'll find that uh, we have uh, different uh, uh, times in the history of the world where safety was used in the pre-industrial period. Uh, it was kings and monarchs and princes that had the responsibility of protecting their subjects, health and safety. And uh, it uh, emphasized primarily the responsibility emphasized disease control. So they applied quarantines like we do it now with the COVID-19. It's a, uh, an issue that is handled by governments uh, the same as in the long past. Uh, and uh, to protect, say, about other forms of disease, like the plague, uh, uh, the people trying to enter cities in the olden times uh, would have to go through a 40 days period of quarantine before being allowed in uh, the cities uh, in general. Uh, then came the Industrial Revolution. Uh, when the Industrial Revolution came in, uh, the steam engine was invented by Mr. Watt in the UK, and uh, you produce a steam. In boilers, uh, the steam would have a very high pressure, and that uh, uh, time in the uh, industrial uh, revolution, uh, those boilers kept exploding, and as they exploded, uh, they caused the deaths of people that are operating them. So to measure their safety, we measure it in terms of uh, a, uh, the occurrence of these accidents, and uh, here, uh, I want to emphasize that uh, uh, it is not a probability of those uh, boilers exploding. What we become concerned with is the frequency of the ex uh, or the likelihood of the failure of those uh, boilers. Uh, those boilers had a very high uh, rate of uh, explosions, uh, but with uh, codes uh, for uh, operating them and for designing them. Right now, uh, the inspections have reduced the incidence of catastrophic failure to the level of 10 to the minus five, which is one in 100,000 failure per vessel per year. Now, this number in the denominator is a statistical number. You can uh, consider it as, if you consider it as 10 to the minus five or one in 100,000, it could mean that if you have a thousand vessels, you should expect the failure once every 100 years. On the other hand, if you have 10,000 vessels, you should consider uh, or expect to get a failure one every 10 years. So in that case, it becomes a major uh, design kind of consideration in the, the design and operation of failures to save human life and, uh, of course, uh, benefit from uh, its use. So today we define here the failure likelihood as the number of failures divided by the number of vessels in a given year. So it's a very simple number. It has units. Uh, it is not a probability. So, and uh, in that case, uh, we introduce one way of measuring uh, the safety of these devices, uh, and notice it is a likelihood or a frequency, it is not a probability. We learn as we go along that probability in mass, as you have learned in your uh, statistics or mass classes, probabilities have no units. And uh, along this line, I'll give you an assignment where you apply this idea to nuclear uh, power plants. So the assignment or the exercises. Uh, suppose that today we have a, a failure uh, uh, likelihood of 10, uh, 10 to the minus five uh, for what we call the loss of coolant accident uh, with an acronym LOCA. 
10 to, is 10 to the minus five, one in 100,000. I want you to calculate what is the frequency of occurrence in the equation for 97 reactors in service in the United States and for 446 reactors globally. You'll find that the numbers match uh, the actual situation of the major accidents that we got, uh, like Chernobyl, Fukushima, and the Three Mile Island accident. And uh, I'll stop uh, at that for our first lecture. Uh, I'll uh, try to post it on the web for those of you who missed the lecture to access it. And uh, I wish you a nice afternoon. And uh, we stop the recording.